Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alamin, wa salatu wa salam ala sayyidah anbiya wa mursalin, wa ala alihi wa ashabi ajma'in, wa ridwanallahu ta'ala alihi majma'in, wa ba'd. Respected brothers and sisters in Islam, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah, it is with the favors and blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we have been given this opportunity that inshallah from today we will be starting a series of weekly lecture pertaining to a hadith pertaining to the saying of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam the prophetic traditions of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam reason being because as Muslims it is our duty that we should seek knowledge from the cradle to the grave and knowledge comes in various aspects but the most important knowledge that we need is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed upon the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and with regards to this Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was a teacher of the Quran Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam what was not there in the Quran Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam taught us from his tradition from his sayings and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says قُلْ هَلْ يَسْتَوِ الَّذِينَ يَعْلَمُونَ وَالَّذِينَ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ Say, are those who know equal to those who do not know? So, as Muslims, it is incumbent upon us that we can try, we can try and we strive to achieve knowledge which is according to Quran and Sunnah. And why I see the hadith? Because of the sin of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that taught us. Before I get into it, I would like to mention a statement of Imam Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah He said there are six levels to knowledge Maratib al-ilm sitta So levels of knowledge are six One is husn al-sawal Excellent questioning That means you do not ask any kind of question But there are manners how you go about of asking question Secondly husn al Excellent listening Because to learn anything you, before you can ask, you need to listen so you can comprehend, you can have an understanding. So listen and observe is something that can lead one towards asking questions that may be beneficial. Third, husn al-fahm, excellent understanding. Knowledge is firmly rooted. So do you stop there? No. As, in, as a matter of fact, you will see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will open more for you whenever you have understanding. Fourth is that of Hivs, memorization. And we all know memorization is something so predominant in Islam. That's why memorizing the Quran is so virtuous. And many people exert themselves in memorizing the Quran. And that knowledge that you understood, it is easier to memorize. You do not memorize it from the beginning, but as you understand it, you memorize it. Fifth is that of Ta'aleem, teaching. Whatever you learn, from all of those step questioning, listening, understanding, and memorization, you can convey this message. And teaching is not for reading from the papers, but it has to do what is from the heart, what is from within oneself because of your faham, of your understanding. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioned a hadith, خَيْرُكُمْ مَنْ تَعَلَّمَ الْقُرْآنَ وَعَلَّمَهُ A few rewriting, أَوْ عَلَّمَهُ that the best of one, the best of you, is one who learns the Quran and teaches it. Or in another narration, one who learns the Quran or teaches it. So we see learning the Quran is there, but teaching it is also part of it that's considered as the best person. And last, Imam Ibn Qayyim Rahimahullah from his six qualities or six levels of knowledge, he mentioned is that of Al Amal Bihi. Acting upon the knowledge which you know. The moment you speak to someone and the other person is eager to hear, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opens up both the speaker and the listener. So, one, whenever you have knowledge also, knowledge knowledge does not comprehend without amal, without action and acting upon it. That is why the two root words in Arabic, in Arabic, the, both of the words, they have the same three letters, ayn, lam, and meem, ilm, and ayn, meem, and lam, amal, knowledge and action. Both goes hand in hand. So, with this levels of, of knowledge as mentioned by Imam Ibn Qayyim rahimahullah I pray by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala let us let us all try to bring some of these one of these levels we try to implement it from our discourses inshallah from our series now I will be using one very famous book and 
the book is no stranger to many of us, which is called al bain al-Nawawi, the 40 hadiths of Imam Nawawi rahimahullah. This book has not been the first book that has been a compilation of 40 hadith. Many scholars before, such as Imam Dar Kutni, Imam Hakim rahimahullah, and others, they all written and they all have wrote books regarding and compiling of books regarding to the ahadith, 40 ahadith. And Imam Nawawi rahimahullah, what makes his book so special is that compiling his 40 hadith, he includes every aspect of deen from regard to practice, from regards to akhlaq, from regards to our character, from regards to our sincerity. He made an inclusion of every aspect in regards to these 40 hadith compilation. And the 40 hadith compilation of Imam Nawawi rahimahullah, it has been known and accepted among scholars for the past seven to eight centuries. So it is not a new book. It is something that has been out there for centuries. So, inshallah, I pray by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by me utilizing this book, it can be a means of us benefiting and also be a means of the author achieving reward, tremendous reward in his abode. Imam and now rahimahullah, he is no stranger to many of our ears. And even though he had a very short lifespan, he recorded and he wrote many famous kitab, many famous books, and he was color, a great scholar of caliber. And some of those famous books I'll mention is that of Riyad al-Salihin. We know this famous book. And this is one of the books that Imam Nawawi rahimahullah, he made author. We know of the book Sahih Muslim. Imam Nawawi rahimahullah have an explanation, a sharah in regards to Sahih Muslim. And regards to the book of the book of Ahadith for Imam Abu Dawood, Imam Nawawi rahimahullah also have an explanation, a sharah for the book of Abu Dawood, the Hadith of Abu Dawood. So just to mention a few of his famous work, and even though he had lived for a short lifespan, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala utilize him for his deen, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make him such a pioneer that his efforts did not go into waste and did not go into vain that even centuries after we have his work in front of us that we can benefit from so without further ado i will get into the first hadith a very famous hadith narrated by amir al-mu'mineen umar ibn al-khattab radiallahu anhu qal sami'tu rasulallahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam yaqul innama al-a'malu bin niyyat wa innama li kulli mir'im ma nawa فَمَنْ كَانَتْ هِجْرَتُهُ إِلَى اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ فَهِجْرَتُهُ إِلَى اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ وَمَنْ كَانَتْ هِجْرَتُهُ لِلدُّنْيَا يُصِيبُهَا أَوْ إِمْرَاتِ يَنْكِحُهَا فَهِجْرَتُهُ إِلَى مَا هَاجَرَ عَلَيْهِ رواه البخاري ومسلم متفق عليه حديث narrated by Umar رضي الله عنه لأمير المؤمنين Umar رضي الله عنه he said I heard the messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم mention saying actions are judged by motives, by one intention. So each man will have what he intended. Thus, whosoever migrate, whosoever make hijra, migrate, his migration was to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and for his messenger, his migration will be rewarded, his reward will be for that of what he migrated for, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his messenger. And, but whosoever migration was for some worldly benefit, some worldly gain, or for a woman that he may get married to, his migration will be rewarded. The reward of his migration will be what he migrated for. So in this hadith was recorded by Imam Bukhari and Imam Muslim. Now let's look some into the background of this hadith. This is the first hadith from the compilation of the 40 hadith of Imam Nawawi rahimahullah. It is said this hadith was mentioned by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam at a time when a man emigrated from Mecca to Medina. And during this hijra, it was said he migrated for marrying someone and not for the sake of Islam. So regards to this, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioned the hadith that if a person migrated for the sake of Islam for Allah and his messenger, his reward will be for that. And if he migrated for worldly benefit to marry someone, his reward will be the like thereof. So that is why Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa mentioned the hadith. That is one of the reason, the main reason why this hadith was mentioned. And this hadith is considered one of the greatest hadith in Islam. Imam Shafi rahimahullah made mention that this hadith is one third of the knowledge of Islam. This hadith is one third of the knowledge of Islam. And it is related to approximately 70 topics of fiqh, 70 topics of jurisprudence. 
That's why you find anywhere you go, any of the Ahadith book you open, there will not be, there will rarely ever be a book that you will not find this Hadith referred to. Hadith is utilized in numerous chapters of any books of Ahadith. Not only one chapter, but numerous chapters. And related to, in with relation to what Imam Shafi Rahimullah made mention, Imam Ahmad bin Hanbal Rahimullah, he also made a statement such that Islam is based on three fundamentals. Islam is based on three fundamentals. And this hadith is one of them. The other two hadiths also is in this book in this compilation of Imam Nawawi. And we'll get into them, but I'll mention a highlight of them. The second hadith is that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa made mention Man ahdatha fi amrina ma laysa minhu fa huwa raddun O kama qala alayhi salatu wa salam That whosoever introduced into, the, into this affair of ours, into our religion Something that was not there, which means an innovation Then it is rejected And the second and the third hadith is that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa made mention Al halalu bayin wa al haramu bayin Wa baynahuma murashabihat that truly lawful is evident and clear and what is unlawful is also evident and clear and in between the two of them there are matters which are doubtful and many people do not know about so these three hadiths Imam Ahmad bin Hanbal rahimullah may mention that these three hadiths are what Islam based upon the fundamentals of Islam is based regarding to all these three hadiths in consideration and all of these three hadiths have, record, have been recorded in the book of Imam Bukhari and Imam Muslim rahimahullah so, <clears throat> let us look at what lessons we can derive from this hadith. So, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam started the hadith with the principles that actions are judged by intentions. And then he mentioned of three examples. Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam always, his methodology, his tariqah, his ways of doing things is always to illustrate an example with something. He used a metaphor or he used an example so one can understand. It's easier for people to understand and they can apply the principle to some other situation. And these three examples consist of one, good intention, two, bad intention, and <coughs> Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam regards to the good intention is that migrate, migrating for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the bad intention is migrating for the sake of worldly gains and for marriage. And in regards to that, also, let us look at what the word niya means. The scholars have mentioned that niya has two meanings. It is an intention before doing an ibadah, before doing a worship, example, a prayer. And second is that of willingness. And in regards to this, we see in this hadith, in regards to these two meanings, this hadith will part in regards to the second aspect the second means that of willingness and willingness is what this hadith entails because of the fact that rasulullah sallallahu alaihi when he mentioned it doesn't have anything to do with the ibadah with the prayer but yes the hadith emphasize ikhlas sincerity of intention to allah subhanahu to be solely for the pleasure of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala truthful to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we perform any acts of worship that we do or any act that we do in our life we do it for allah subhanahu wa ta'ala pleasure to achieve ikhlas, to achieve sincerity, we have to avoid shirk. We have to avoid associating anything with partners Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And associating partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala causes insincerity. And there is different type of shirk. We will not get into the details of that. But for example, doing something, you pray in your salah, but someone walk by and you decide to, oh, I'm praying that this person can see how pious I am. This person can see how devoted I am in my salah. That is form of causing an insincerity in your heart. That you're not doing this for the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Imam al-Hawi said that the root cause for insincerity or shirk is self-desire. Therefore, no action should be done because of self-desire. No action should be done because of our nafs, that we follow in our nafs. He said there are seven types, Imam al harawi he mentioned there are seven types of self-desire or seven types of nafs following your nafs. One, to make oneself appear good in the hearts of others. Two, is to seek the praises of others. Three, to avoid being blamed by others. Four, is to seek the guidance, or, um, to seek the glorification of others. You want others to praise you. Five, is to seek the wealth and money of others. You're doing things so that others can pay you. 
they can compensate you regards to it. Six is to seek the services of or love of others. And last but not least, to seek the help of others for oneself. That these are acts of self desire that you're going to do an act of worship, but you're doing it for one of these seven benefits. In this way, one will not be able to attain true ikhlas, true sincerity, but in fact, one will be leading their action towards insincerity because you're doing it for other reasons. And various ways of obtaining ikhlas, but just I'll mention a few points is that do righteous deeds, the more righteous deeds we do, and constant righteous deeds we do, it will help us to increase our intention only for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and be more sincere. And secondly, before we do any good deed, before we do any aspect of beneficial deeds or good action, we should seek knowledge about it. We should learn about it so that we know our action it will be rewarded with what. What will be the outcome of our action if we do have to do this good action? And last I would like to mention is that always check your intention. If there's three aspects I'll mention to check your intention. You always check your intention before you commit an act, before you start doing any act. And whilst doing the act, also check your intention again. Am I doing this for the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And when you completed the act, you also ask yourself again, have I done this action for the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? If your intention has been going throughout all these three phases, then Alhamdulillah, we pray Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept your action. But if it was not done, or if you see within one of these three phases, it was not done for the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you make a stick fire, you seek for from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and if it's possible, you try to reduce the action with true sincerity to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may accept our action. I pray and beg Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He gave us the understanding that whenever we do any action, whether it's a good deed, whether it's some good action, we do it only for the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Regards to our worship, we know there is many worship that we cannot do except with sincere intention. We cannot do without making intention at the beginning. Example for salah, for example, for doing acts of ibadat, you always need to make an intention before you do any sort of prayer. For fasting in the month of Ramadan, we just completed Ramadan. We have to make intention before our fast. So there are certain actions of ibadat that is not accepted except without an, with an intention at the beginning. But also there are actions that you don't need an intention for at the beginning that you, for it to be fulfilled. For example, giving sadaqah, charity to a poor person, you don't need to make an intention before in that aspect. But obviously your sincerity should be only for the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us give us understanding. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us that we can continue this series weekly, inshallah. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us benefit from it. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala increase all of us in knowledge, increase myself and all of us in knowledge. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy on my tongue so that I can be able to fulfill whatever justice, fulfill justice and do justice towards whatever words I'm giving out or whatever advice that I'm spreading from the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And if there is anything beneficial, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept it. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us to utilize it and if there is any deficiency in whatever i've said may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive me and it's from my own wrongdoings and may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept us and help us that we can have the understanding of the ahadith of rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa akhiru da'wana and alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh